Writing on feminist theology for an established theological journal is as dangerous as navigating between Scylla and Charybdis. Radical feminists might consider such an endeavor as cooperation with the enemy, or at best as tokenism. Professional theologians might refuse to take the issue seriously or might emotionally react against it. Even though the women's movement has been with us almost a decade, it is still surrounded by confusion, derision, and outright refusal to listen to its arguments. Yet, since I consider myself a feminist as well as a Christian theologian, I am vitally interested in a mediation between feminism and theology, and good theology always was a risky enterprise. That was a quote from Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza, and this is the Liberation Theology Podcast, a close look at the basic concepts of Latin American liberation theology. I'm your host, David Inchauskas. Welcome back to the Liberation Theology Podcast. Today I'm joined by an incredible guest, Maria Soledad del Villar Tagle, and we'll be talking about feminist liberation ecclesiology. Sole was born in Santiago de Chile in 1985. She lives in the Boston area while pursuing her PhD in systematic theology at Boston College. I was blessed to meet Sole in person in Boston a couple of weeks before the recording of this episode. She's also a resident minister serving college students at BC. During her life, Sole has been able to combine her academic interests in theology, feminism, and politics with an active life in pastoral work among marginalized communities and young people both in Chile and in the United States. She is also a history teacher and holds two masters, one in contemporary history and one in theology. She recently published a book that narrates the stories of the social workers of the Vicaria de la Solidaridad, a Catholic institution that defended human rights during the last Chilean dictatorship from 1973 to 1989. Our interview covers the church from numerous intersecting angles, feminism, liberation, Chile, personal experiences, and clerical sexual abuse. I'm thankful for Sole's generosity in joining the podcast for this episode to speak about her life and her work. Two short announcements before moving into the conversation. First, the podcast now has an Instagram page, yay, at Lib Theo Podcast, where Sarah, the Xavier student with whom I work on the podcast, and I post stories, book recommendations, show images, Bible quotes, and personal photos related to Latin American liberation theology. Take a look at it and follow, and we always follow back. Second, we are trying to expand the podcast audience so that more folks can learn about and interact with Latin American liberation theology. And one of the ways that can happen is if you leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform it is through which you access the show. And when shows have more ratings, the platform is more likely to recommend the show to potential listeners. So please consider leaving a review. That said and out of the way, enjoy this dynamic and thought-provoking conversation with Sole. Welcome, Sole, to the Liberation Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us. And some folks may be familiar with your work, some folks may not. And so I was hoping that we might begin, uh, Sole, with an introduction. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your work. Okay, so right now I'm a PhD student in systematic theology at Boston College. I'm on my third year, and I have a master's in history also, and a master's in theology, of course. I guess my academic background combines those two disciplines, and I have one published book 
which is amazing. Uh, that was my master's thesis in history, uh, and it's about Vicaria de la Solidaridad. That was an institution of the Archbishop of Santiago that during the dictatorship opposed Pinochet and defended human rights of people who were being persecuted. So in terms of academics, that will be my background. Thank you so much. And our topic for today is ecclesiology, feminism, and liberation theology. Perhaps one way we can begin that discussion would be how have liberation theologians understood the church and how specifically have feminist liberation theologians understood the church and how might these understandings of church differ from other understandings of church that we might find in other Christian theologies? Okay, so for liberation theology in Latin America, I will say the main ecclesiological understandings comes from the experience of Christian-based communities. So liberation theology, at least in Latin America, is not only an intellectual like movement, but it's an ecclesial movement. And that ecclesial movement is based in poor communities, urban or in the countryside, who gather every two times a month or every week to discuss, to do Bible discussion, and then to see their reality in light of the word of God, right? So there's this method uh, that was very popular in Latin America in the 70s and the 80s that was part of the Christian-based communities, that is the See, Judge, Act methodology. So you see what's going on in your neighborhood, in your community, in your country, then you judge that in accordance to the gospel message. So is this that is happening, is this unjust or is it, or is it just? This, does this contribute to the reign of God or not? Those kind of questions. And then the community decides to act upon. So if they see a concrete problem in their neighborhood and they see that the gospel is calling them to address that problem, they will finish with action, right? So that method and that way of being church, I think, influences a lot of what liberation theologians have written about ecclesiology. I'm bringing here, for example, the work of Leonardo Boff. His first work was Ecclesiogenesis. That was the title of his work. And that's so Ecclesiogenesis is that the birth of a new church that was that he what he did was that he was part of this christian based communities there was a big encounter in brazil of christian based communities of all over latin america and he just took notes of what he heard that common people was, were saying about the church and he created a, a ecclesiology starting from there and then of course his work iglesia carisma y poder that in english is like church charism and power, something like that, that reflects on that. So I will guess that experience of the Christian-based communities is at the source of what liberation theologians have said on ecclesiology. But then you have the feminist critique that I will say it has been more timid, timida, more cautious in Latin America. We have to remember also that Boff's work was condemned or there was a notification by, by the Vatican, precisely again, his work on ecclesiology, right? So that also sets the stage for ecclesiology being a very hard topic for theologians and a topic that will get them in trouble. So feminist theologians who are also liberationists tend to not to write too much about uh, ecclesiology, but if you talk to them, that's a different story, right? <laughs> so I was talking with a friend the other day trying to see if there was any, for example, a mujerista theologian. So mujerista are the feminist theologians that are from Latino origins, but work in the United States, uh, Maria Isasi, Diaz. And my friend told me, no, they they don't write about it. There's in part there, because there's no time, maybe there are, more, there are more urgent things to write about, but also because it's a hard topic to write on, especially from a feminist perspective, because from a feminist perspective, you will immediately, for example, critique the priesthood and the all-male priesthood. And that critique, you know, has also been censored by the Vatican, especially by John Paul II. So it's a hard place to be in. Uh, and many people, just because they want to preserve their work, their jobs in a university that's Catholic and that's controlled by the bishop, prefer not to, to go into those topics. Still, I will say one important thing that I've heard in conversations that is different in the U.S. context and in the Latin American context from feminist theologians and 
feminist human beings who are part of Christian communities is that here in the U.S. there's a and in in Europe there's a strong emphasis on women's ordination as an issue of social justice within the Catholic Church and an issue of gender justice. In Latin America, I will say, especially because of this experience of Christian-based communities, the emphasis is not so much on we want women ordained priests, but rather we want the whole community to have more power in decision making. So most people or most women in Latin America don't see, I will say, the solution for this problem of clericalism, for example, in communities as having, for example, married people in the priesthood or women in the priesthood, but rather on not having maybe a priesthood at all, right? And having lay people be in charge of more things in communities, maybe without that sacramental element. But it's an ongoing discussion. I myself think that we need to do both things. So because I think sacraments are such an important part of the life of communities. Until now, sacraments are very tied to the priesthood or to deacons. So we need to open that sacrament, like our sacraments to more people. I I would love to see a woman preside in a Eucharist, for example. I don't see that every Sunday. And I think it, it hurts women because it sends a message that we're not worthy to lead the community to share the sacraments with them. I've even had dreams of baptizing my, like the sons and daughters of my friends. <laughs> and I, uh, so I think that's important. And at the same time, we need that communities have more, yeah, ma- more power in decision makings, that not everything goes through a hierarchical structure. And in that, right now, because of this process of the synod of the synod, <laughs> synod of synodality that Pope Francis is, is organizing and a lot of the Episcopal Conference of Latin America created like this big consultation to lay people in the church and a lot of people are participating and all these topics are being raised there. Of course, we will love that that participation will be everywhere. I know that in many places, this is just something that people are not even aware of like priests and bishops who are who do not agree are not fostering this are not inviting people to the discussions a lot of people don't even know that this is happening even in latin america but at least those who know that it's happening are bringing these topics forward and so we we don't know if they're going to affect final like like if they're going to get into the structures of the Vatican and, the, and if the bishops are actually going to talk about what the lay people are talking but at least there's there an open window for those issues and perhaps as a follow-up question to the topic of ecclesiology and liberation theology and feminist liberation theology if you feel comfortable sole would you be willing to share part of your experience maybe your life experience in the church you know, growing up to the present what has the church been like to you? What what does the church mean to you? Yes. So um, I was born in a, very, in a Catholic family. Most uh, more, yeah, a Catholic family. All my grand, my my two grandfathers, my father, all my uncles went to Jesuit high schools. So like I I also went to a Catholic school and high school all my life. So so Catholicism was part of my environment. I also come from a country that is when I was born, I will say more than 80% of the people declare themselves Catholics. So being Catholic was part of the landscape. Everybody w- will go to Mass on Sunday, even though, for example, my father never was never very pious, either my mother, uh, not very involved, but it was just part of the culture. But I get I got more committed into to the church through my work as a volunteer when I was at the end of high school and then all my period at college, I was a volunteer in Un Techo para Chile, eh, or Techo, that's an um, NGO that works, that builds emergency housing for people who don't have proper housing and works in what we call in Chile campamentos. That's like in English, like shanty towns or places where people who don't have a home will go to a terrain or a, to a piece of land that's maybe publicly owned or that it's not used and they will just build a house with the materials they have. They will not have access to water, to electricity. So I worked with those communities through this NGO and this NGO was run by a Jesuit priest called Felipe Berrios and by university students. It was, it was university-led. So it was university students, this Jesuit priest, 
and then of course the leaders of these communities. And in that uh, work as a volunteer, I encountered a different face of the church that was not only about prayer and beliefs, but also about action and working, working directly with the poor and for the poor. And that that experience got me like interested in faith, in theology, especially in liberation theology. And since then I've mixed both this academic side that's part of me with this more social and social political and also religious side that's centered in social action. That's the core of my original experience. But then of course, I was also, I'm part, in my family were five sisters, all women. And I went to a high school and a school of also all women, Catholic high school. And the sisters in that high school were very, I will say, in yeah, in some in some sense progressive in the sense that they taught us that women were not only to have a like get a husband and have kids but also have a career and work and uh, be leaders in society and all of that so when I started to work more intimately with the church I started to realize that maybe the places that I had in society as a woman were not the same as the places that I could have in the church just a small example I also was part of the religious just life for three years. It was an awful experience, honestly, partly because of this. Uh, but my first intention was, oh, I want something like the Jesuits, but for women. So I went to look at a religious community of Ignatian spirituality. But it was not until like I spent there a couple of months and I started to realize like the position of women in the church is not the same as the position of men. I started to go to mass every Sunday. No, every day, sorry, every day with the sisters and realizing that I had, I lived with a group of sisters. All of them had studied theology. All of them were very smart, very loved by their communities, very capable. But the role in the community was so, so reduced because the priest made all the decisions, uh, the priest made all the preaching. They will, in mass, they will be only playing the guitar on the side, right? So that's like a very... Like that image of being in this community of women and having, on the other hand, this priest that could be a good priest or a bad priest or whatever, but that controls all the decisions and controls also like the public, the public voice of the community and not being able to do anything about it was very evident for me at that moment. And it's one of the things that made me go more deeper into feminism, right? Like being aware of something that was already there for a long time, but that I haven't noticed before as unjust or as a problem until I started to see it every day. And you were referring to the campamentos. I remember a trip to Lima, Peru, and I was stunned and moved with compassion to see what were referred to colloquially in Peru as the Pueblos Jóvenes, mm -hmm. where many folks from the countryside who had lost work or were struggling would then move to the city, maybe would not be able to afford housing in the city, or there just wasn't abundant housing in the city, and so would settle in the outskirts of the town or in these public areas that you're describing. And in in some cases, there were literal walls that were then built separating the rich communities from these campamentos humanos of mm -hmm. those who were moving into the urban area. And I just remember being totally scandalized by that environment. And so I was curious that you brought that up and that that was kind of part of your own life experience uh, working with Techo. I know, Sole, that you have studied the church in Chile, and I've read a few of your articles about Alberto Hurtado, for example. And could you give us an overview of the 20th and 21st century Chilean church? And maybe what role did St. Alberto Hurtado play? What roles did the church play in the socialist movement of Salvador Allende and then the subsequent dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet? And what role have liberation theologians and feminist liberation theologians played in the Chilean church? And who might be some of the main figures? Some folks may be familiar with Alberto Hurtado, but who would be some other folks in the Chilean church in the liberationist section who would be important for listeners to know about? Okay, that's a lot of questions. And those are all topics that I'm very interested in. So I can speak a lot about this. So the 20th century, I will say the Catholic church in Chile was very influenced by 
by Catholic social teaching. And Alberto Hurtado was one of the figures in Chile that helped to make Catholic social teaching known in Chile, especially amongst the youth, both the elites, but also the, the working classes. And and he, of course, he's a saint, he's a Jesuit saint. If you go to Chile, to Santiago, like you will have streets that are called Padre Hurtado everywhere. <laughs> And so he's a very, he's a major figure in Chile, especially because of this, because he lived this, the social dimension of the gospel was very important to him, social justice. And he created one of the, a lot of institutions that are like the Jesuits in Chile. And like most of the things that the Jesuits in Chile do today are, come from initiatives that Alberto Hurtado put in place. But Alberto Hurtado was not alone. He was part of a bigger movement that started with Verum Novaru by the end of the 19th century. And of course, an expression of that was a, not only a shift within the church towards a wider engagement through charity, social justice, Catholic uh, labor movements, uh, working with shanty towns. So Techo, in part, is inheritor of a work that the church has been doing since the 40s, since the first communities that weren't able to get that. Exactly the, the situation that you described in Lima is, is also the situation in Santiago and in other big cities in Chile, right? So, so that started in the 40s, and the church was in the ground working with communities to build this emergency housing and in the ground they will work also for example with a communist party you will have in the 40s and the 50s some sectors in the church that will be very anti-communism and even in the works of Alberto Hurtado you will have some anti-communism under undertone so I don't think he's still liberation theologian but at the same time in the ground you have this collaboration of the left and the Catholic Church in this concern of helping the people to have proper housing, to advance their labor rights and ad all other initiatives. So, so you have all of that previous to Vatican II. And then after Vatican II, it's, it intensifies a lot because in some sense, that side of the church that was very socially engaged is the side of the church that received also Vatican II as a good news and implemented. Uh, one of the the best friend of Alberto Hurtado was Bishop Manuel Larraín. They were friends since they were college students and Hurtado became a Jesuit and Manuel Larraín a diocesan bishop and then a uh, diocesan priest and then a bishop. And Manuel Larraín was one of the heads, he created Selam. So he went to Vatican II. So he's a very, also a very, very important figure. He, he died very, he died in a accident, car accident in the 60s. And then Hurtado also died young. He died in the 50s from cancer. So we don't know what those two figures would have said of what happened in Chile afterwards, but they were very influential. And when the dictatorship came, most of the Chilean church was very involved in social issues. They were working with the poor. So when the dictatorship came and the dictatorship started persecuting leftist people, the church saw all of that, right? Because they were already there. There were religious communities living in the shanty towns, in the campamentos. They were connected with the people from the agrarian reform. They were also connected with people on the factories, everything. We had worker priests. So all that, that connect, those connections between the left, the world of, of the poor masses of, of Chile and the church, all of that previous work informed the situation that when the dictatorship came, the church was the safest place and the place that people could trust that they can go and say, look, yesterday the, my, my father or my son what, uh, didn't came back. I don't know where they are. What can we do? Right. So a lot of people who were being persecuted went to the church in order to find some protection. And the bishops at that time reacted to this, welcoming the people and organizing this. First, there was this uh, ecumenical institution called Comité Pro Paz. And then Pinochet, after two years of Comité Pro Paz, closed it. And because it was an ecumenical institution, it was legally under the rule of the government. The government had to give them permission to exist. But what Raul Silva Enriquez did, that was the bishop of Santiago at that time, is that he said to uh, the dictator, okay, I will close Comité Pro Paz, but 
the church will still be involved in human rights defense. And then he created Vicaria de la Solidaridad. And Vicaria was something that Pinochet was not able to close because it was directly under the authority of the bishop. It was a Catholic institution and the bishop and then the Vatican. So if he would close that, he will get into a big international conflict, right? So that would, he, Bishop uh, Silva Enriquez made this smart move, created Vicaria. And Vicaria did two things. One thing was working directly with people who were being persecuted, the families of the disappeared, people who were being tortured. All of those groups of people went to Vicaria, had social workers, lawyers that will help them in their efforts to, to find justice for their relatives. But the other thing that Vicaria did that is less famous, but I think it's equally important, is that they did a lot of work with poor urban communities. So Vicaria worked with Christian-based communities, with popular parishes, and they will organize soup kitchens, like workshops for people who were without a, without a job, and different like social initiatives that were, that were from the grassroots up. And that was very important because we have to remember that that Pinochet dictatorship was not only a dictatorship that violated human rights, but also it was a neoliberal dictatorship. So one of the things that they did immediately after they seized power was to start to dismantle all the social programs that the state had to help people, to help poor people, right? So for example, one of those was Salvador Allende had this program that was one liter of milk every day for every children. And that was, it was iconic. So Pinochet took that away. Also, closed, there was, there's this big, big hospital. We have to remember that Salvador Allende was a doctor also, a medical doctor. So there's this big hospital that he started to build in a very poor neighborhood in Santiago, in the outskirts. And the building of that hospital stopped when the dictatorship came. And it's not until like four or five years ago that that building was converted into something useful. <laughs> but that's a symbol, right? A symbol of how a lot of initiatives that came from the previous period that were aimed towards social justice, towards helping poor people were immediately stopped by Pinochet and Vicaria also helped helped in that in those areas, also social areas. I will say, connecting this to liberation theology, that, and this is also a very interesting side of things, is that uh, liberation theology and liberation theologians in Chile have been more practically, the, practically than academically oriented, even though we have a few important figures, for example, Rolando Muñoz, Pablo Richards, who just died a few days ago, but Pablo Richards was expelled from Chile when the dictatorship came. So he did most of his career in Costa Rica. Uh, Rolando Muñoz was expelled from the Catholic University. So he, because he was a member of a religious community, he was able to keep writing, but he did that from his work with Christian-based communities and not from the academy. And that happened because one of the things that Pinochet did also when he seized power was to put military men in charge of the universities of the country including the Catholic University. So the bishop that was very progressive and was very open, etc., was not able to have any control of what happened in Catholic University. So in the Catholic University, liberation theology was not welcomed because, of course, it was under military rule. So, so that, I think, speaks up a little bit about the context and why you don't hear about like this famous liberation theologian from Chile. But what you have is this famous movement, Vicaria de la Solidaridad, and not only Vicaria, but also the Christian-based communities, communities like the community of Father uh, Pepe Aldunate, that he's considered like the Martin Luther King of Chile because he organized Comité contra la Tortura Sebastián Acevedo, and this committee against torture what, that what they will do is nonviolent actions outside of places where torture was taking place or in front of government buildings denouncing torture. So you have all these movements of people inspired by liberation theology that were working directly in church institutions, in Christian-based communities, in NGOs, etc., that were opposing the dictatorship since its beginnings and helped articulate the wider movement of opposition, opposition to Pinochet. Yeah, and even having an important role in the return to democracy that was mostly done by a peaceful 
movement. There was a lot of struggle, but it was mostly peaceful transition. And that also has to do with the influence, I say, of the church. And the final question you made that I remember now is about women and feminist liberation theologians in all of this schema. I will say, and this is something that I wrote about in, in my book, because my book is about the social workers of Vicaria and their work as professionals. And during the 80s, the feminism was not a part of the origins of liberation theology. In fact, a lot of feminist authors will criticize that first generation precisely because they didn't include gender issues as part of the social justice issues that they were they were denouncing. They, especially in Latin America, liberation theology had in its origins a very socioeconomic starting point to understand oppression. So the feminist critique will say, okay, socioeconomic is a very important part of oppression in Latin America, and it's a very important part of the things that we we need to change inequality, poverty, etc. But there's other dimensions like race or gender that also influence in oppression of people. And if you think of women, especially of poor women in Latin America, they're doubly or triply oppressed. So they're oppressed not only because they're, they're poor, but also because they're women. So they experience, for example, lack of access to jobs, they experience domestic violence or other forms of machista violence in their daily lives. So that's something that was not part of the origins of liberation theology. And it was also not a part of the main worries of the left in Chile during the 70s, during the 60s. If you go back to, and a lot of feminist Chilean authors speak about, speak about this, that if you go back to Unidad Popular, the, the, mob, the, the government of Salvador Allende, the only group of people who were not organized as a collective to fight for their rights at the time of Salvador Allende were women. So there were organizations of women, especially around motherhood. So, and there were health, there were social like programs for to help mothers, the Litro de Leche that I already speak, spoke about, but women, were not organized qua women to fight for their rights. That only started to be a part of the social struggle in Chile in the 80s. Partly influenced, of course, by feminist feminism worldwide, but also because there was a because women were the first ones who organized themselves against a dictatorship. And this has an explanation because the dictatorship persecuted mainly men. Men were organized mainly in sindicatos, so in labor unions. And of course, at that time, most of women didn't have jobs. Most of women will stay at home and take care of the children, even poor, poor women. So their political participation was not seen by the dictatorship as something dangerous. So most of the people, for example, if you go to the disappeared, I will say 80 or 85% were men, also the people who were tortured, also the people who were exiled. Then of course, but that also of course affected women. So their wives, their sisters, their mothers were the ones who organized themselves to claim for their lives. So, and that was, as I told you, in part because that dictatorship didn't persecute it. It still persecuted women, but not as much as men. And also because they were perceived as, as less dangerous. So women were the first one to organize. If you go to the, the history, for example, of Vicaria, or even the Christian-based communities and the parishes, you will see that, and that, what, what, that was one of the motivations for me to write my book, is that most of the stories speak about this big bishop and great lawyers that did all this work, but the work on the ground, on the grassroots was being made by women. And women started to reflect on that in the 80s. And when they started to reflect on that, they started to organize themselves as women and to, to read their own oppression, not only as part of poor communities, but also as women started to criticize violence against women. And there was this slogan of that time that's democracia en el país, en la casa y en la cama, democracy in the country, in the home and in our beds. That was all about how these things are interconnected, right? And if we're fighting against oppression in society and we're fighting against the dictator, we also have to fight against or to change like the small dictatorships that we live in everyday life if we're women. So, and I will say that that how that influenced liberation theologians, I will say that the influence was not very big. I will say that the church, especially like the liberationist sectors were more invested 
in this discourse of socioeconomic inequalities, of the importance of the workers, the working class, I will think that this, the things that women were fighting for were distracting the country from the main fight that was against a dictatorship and in favor of having back labor unions, having back political parties. So there was, I will say there like a divorce. And there's this very important group in Chile of feminist theologians, uh, and not only theologians, also like from social sciences that was that was created in the 80s that's called Conspirando. So it's breathing together, but also this idea of like plotting something. That's the two dimensions of that word in, in Spanish. And when you go to their documents and their origins, they say, we were part of Christian-based communities, we were part of this church, but when we started to make the feminist questions, we started to feel that there was there was no, no space for us in these places. So they created this collective, they had a journal that has still publishes members, but they, in some sense, disconnected themselves from the Catholic Church and from the liberationist movement because they didn't found place for them. And I think that divorce is one of the reasons why my generation never, I never read anything related to feminist liberation theology until a few years ago, because it was not part of the life of our church. The conditions were not there. And then of course, in the nineties afterwards, when we recovered democracy, but also all these progressively minded bishops started Started to retire and were replaced with more conservative minded bishops, there was even less space or openness to the issues that women were raising. And I will say that has it, this is changing right now. And this is the last thing I will say, and then I will give you your word back to ask more questions. But in the past few years in Chile, we've been seeing a huge movement, huge movements from for change. This started before with the students' movements that I was also a part of those, and I, we can speak a little bit more about that. 2011, 2009, 2011, we had big, big demonstrations, public demonstrations uh, organized by students demanding free and quality edu and public education for the whole country. But then in 2017, you have a reemergence of feminism in Chile, connected with the Me Too movement in the United States. States and, uh, and uh, in other places connected to New Namenos, that is this movement in Mexico, especially Argentina, Peru, uh, against feminicide, connected to, of course, the issue of abortion rights, all of that. We have in Chile a big emergence of feminism that started also from the universities, from female students denouncing violence, sexual violence against them in the university. And that started to grow. And when that started to happen, and massive, massive public demonstrations in the streets. And at the same time that that started to happen out there, a group of women, a group of Catholic women, which I was a part of, who worked within church structures, we started to meet to discuss our situation in the church. So we we're all working. I was working with the Jesuits. I have other friends working with different vicarias, education, young people, working in parishes, theologians, etc. We were like the same age around between 25 and 30 something. And, and at the beginning, we just started to discuss, okay, like we love working for the people, we love working for the church, but we also experienced a lot of discrimination, a lot of violence within our workplace and our church belonging. So what do we do with that? So it started almost like gathering to drink tea and <laughs> and cry and, and complain about things that were happening to us and like share our experience experiences, good and, and bad experiences. But because of like the wider feminist movement in the country, I think our the, the topics that we were raising started to be of more interest for a wider audience. So we decided to create, to, to have a first national encounter. And we just invited friends from parishes, Christian-based communities, organizations, etc. And long story short, this ends up being this movement called Mujeres Iglesia that has been fighting for equality within the church, but also has been part of this huge mobilizations, public mobilizations in society in general, trying to work for human, for women's rights in general. And because 
this issue has been so important for Chilean society. And I think it's been like this last wave of feminism has in some sense impacted the church more. More people, more priests, some bishops, uh, more people in the communities are being aware that this is a problem and are more willing to discuss women's issues, are more open to learn, for example, from feminist theology. So, so right now, I think we're in a window of time in which there's a lot of conflict, of course. There's a lot of very conservative people that, of course, don't want any feminist agenda within the church. But at the same time, you have also this wider recognition that the position that women have in the church is a problem and we need solutions. And the last thing that I think informs this is, of course, a sexual abuse crisis in the church that in Chile has been very, very strong and that has provoked this wide critique of clericalism as part of this problem a wider critique of clerical culture. And, in, and part of that critique to clericalism and clerical culture is, of course, the situation of women. I remember one of my aunts, she's very Catholic, she's very devout, she's very conservative. And she told me what, when I visited Chile a few years ago, she told me, I, I want to speak with you because you're a theologian and we need to discuss all these things. And I was very surprised because she's 80 years old or more. She's very conservative. But the first thing she said to me, when are women will be able to be bishop? Because I am sure that if women were in places of power, this whole mess that we have with sexual abuse will not be there because women know that this is not right and they take care of children and blah, blah, blah. So that, that was for me an example of a change in culture, how things that previously were not being asked or were being asked by the small minority are now being asked even by all the women <laughs> who are not feminists but see, see, see the issues. So yeah, I spoke a lot. <laughs> I do want to return yeah. to two things that you mentioned, Sole. The first one being student movements, because I, I don't know if you would necessarily agree with this, or I would love to hear your thoughts on it. But what I found in general would be that students in Latin America tend to be more organized, more mobilized, maybe on these social, political, economic, feminist questions than students in the United States. I think of the example of Honduras, which I'm most familiar with. It seems that at the UNA, the National Autonomous University of Honduras, they are there are Tomas takes, I guess, where the yeah, students yeah. literally take over the exactly. university <laughs> and then express their demands. Sometimes they will lock themselves inside buildings. They will stand around buildings, not letting anyone in until the administration comes to an agreement with the student leaders. And so these things are seen as rather radical, I would say, by many students in the United States. States, where maybe some students in the United States may march around campus or may have discrete meetings with folks, mm -hmm. and those are important actions. It seems to me that sometimes students in Latin America are more militant in their advocacy for their concerns and also have a more democratic vision of the university. I think uh, mm -hmm. for worse, probably, in the United States, we have all of the worst aspects of consumerism without the best aspects of consumerism in that, of course, there are university education costs a lot, but then those who are paying often have very little to no say in how the university is run. And so I would love to hear more. You mentioned that you would be open to sharing more about the student movement and that we could return to that question. So I really do want to return to okay. that question. Yeah. What has been your experience with student movements in Chile? And then also just some comments in general about the power of students and the influence that students can have over the shaping of their own university experiences, but then also the broader national experience. Yes. So one of the things that surprised me a lot when I came here to the U.S. was precisely that, how the lack of mobilization of students here, like how the college culture here is so different. My friends in Chile uh, laugh uh, about me, like they say, like, do you miss tear gas <laughs> now that you're over there? Especially in Alberto Hurtado, when I, where the university, Alberto Hurtado, is a Jesuit university in Chile that's in the center of the city. Uh, so where a lot of protests uh, happen. And we have Thomas and all of that that you were describing, like the same thing. We smell tear gas every few weeks. <laughs> and in some years it was part of, it's 
it was part of the landscape. So yeah, part of me miss, misses uh, tear gas <laughs> in the sense that, uh, yeah, like I think here in the United States, people, there's this whole talk about the college experience. So you go to live to college, you have this great experience with your friends, you live almost in this, for me, at least at BC, I, I call it that all-inclusive of academia. <laughs> So you live in this place where everything, like you have everything, you have housing, food, you have a great gym, sports, and also like the best academics that you can imagine, ex excellent pr teachers, professors, research, everything. It's like a resort. Exactly. It's like a resort. Exactly. And uh, universities in Chile are very different. So you don't live in the campus. You live with your parents or you rent an apartment with your friends if you can. Most people just live with their parents because you don't have money money to do anything else and you just go for classes and in universities then you have a lot of political and social uh, organization and mobilization so when I was a college student I will say that there was not such a big political movement within the students uh, organizations so you will have of course you have elections every every year and you elect a student council and they're very influential in every university I never heard about the student I don't even know if a student council exists here and if it exists they they're not as important if you go to a university in Chile by the end of the year you will have political campaigns with pictures of people and programs and debates and people will go to the elections and elect their leaders for the year and it's a very very important part of of the life of universities but when I was a college student previous to 2000 11, I will say most of these organizations in the universities were centered around just organizing good parties and very in internal issues and not engaged in the wider political uh, context. So that's why, for example, my generation, uh, we decided to go into social action through organizations of the church because that, that was felt at that point to be more political than fighting to have a place on the student council in the university. But I think that change it, that changed, and I was able to see that change starting on 2006. That was my third year of college. And the students from high schools, from public high schools, started to organize these demonstrations to ask for, to have free public, era pública, gratuita y de calidad. So free public and of quality education. There, there's a lot of inequality in Chile in education. You will have private schools that are very that are very good and you have very good education uh, and then you will have public schools that are that are and this is also one of the consequences of neoliberalism and the dictatorship you will have public schools that are unfunded that have lesser quality that pay ridiculous low amounts of salaries for their teachers so they don't you have a lot of inequality in education and that inequality is one of the things that the students started to fight for to change so the first movement was in 2006 and the rest of the people started to be very sympathetic to this movement and then you will have in 2011 this big demonstration so so it's it's almost like the same generation of people, like two year or three years younger than I am, that first mobilized when they were high school students and then when they were college students to fight for more equality and education for the country. And I think that that politicized a lot of the student movements and a lot of people that I know that were previously involved in social action through the church moved towards this political movement in connected to universities, colleges, etc. I'm part of that. I'm part of that, even though I'm a little bit older than the generation that led that. Like I've been tear gassed many times. I've been there in the street. I've run from the police, all that, all that stuff. I've also seen like the Thomas in the university, both as a student and also then as a teacher teacher with the problems and also the good things that that has. And right now in Chile, we're going to a through a very interesting process. We're writing a new constitution. This writing of the new constitution is, so we had this big, big 
estallido social, we, call, we called it, or revuelta social, this big popular revolt by the end of 2019, just before the pandemic started. And it was also started by students because there was a slight race in the bus tickets and train tickets of Santiago, the city. And well, it was an accumulation of things, but that was the starting point of a movement of students that they will say, we will not pay for our fare when we go into the, into the buses and the trains. So they started to jump to jump over the turnstiles where you pay, right? And then after the students came, all the people doing the same thing, and it created like this massive, massive, massive movement of people in industries protesting against a lot of things, not only inequality in education, also inequality like the pension system, healthcare, and a lot of different social issues that we are facing right now in Chile. And I will summarize them under the label inequality, right? We're one of the richest countries in Latin America, but there's a small elite that has all the wealth and the majority of the people that live like in very precarious conditions. So after this uh, movement of public protest, one of the political solutions to that to this was, okay, we need to create a new constitution because our constitution was drafted by Pinochet during the dictatorship. So it's a constitution that was not at all popularly approved. It was not democratical. And a lot of the things that we want to change, we were unable to change them because it's unconstitutional. It's not in the constitution. And I see the student movement has also been behind or this or the students have been the starting force and then the rest of the people will go behind these movements of change. And right now one of for example our presidential candidates is Gabriel Boric who was a student leader in 2011. So a group of these students created this different political parties. I'm part of one of them and created like this new political force from the left that is different from concertación, that it's also, it's more center left and it's from an older generation. So the people who fought fought against the dictatorship and who ruled the country in terms with the right wing politicians for more than 30 years, but got in, in the way they got yeah a lot of corruption and yeah, a lot of problems that haven't been solved. So the student movement in some sense, yeah, is that it was a, like the starting point of a lot of changes. They were moving the rest of society towards those, those changes and also are yeah creating like a lot of young people are right now in this constitutional assembly yeah, that come from social movements, that come from these new political parties of that come from the student movement. So of course, yeah, yeah, young people, social movements are a very, very, very big starting point for change in Chilean politics right now. And that that would be a word to the wonderful students who listen to this podcast. I think that the events that you're describing are very inspirational. I also want to return to something else that you mentioned in the previous section, which was we know that though the so, the sexual abuse crisis has affected the church worldwide, and it does seem though that Chile has been a particularly important locus, particularly as far as the press. Chile is a country that comes up in the United States press pretty frequently. So what is the story of clerical sex abuse in Chile and how is it different from and similar to the story in the United States? And then how might we approach this topic of clerical sex abuse from a feminist uh, liberationist perspective? Okay, so one of the scary things about this crisis in the church is that it's so similar in different parts of the world. So if you go to the reports in Ireland now, a few days ago, a new report came from France, the United States, Chile, Australia, like you will encounter similar narratives. And that's, that's why this is a global phenomenon. So I will say there's a lot of things that are similar in Chile in, in terms of the widespread of the problem, like it's everywhere. But I will say in Chile it had like some particularities. So first, the first allegations, or maybe there were allegations before, but the first one that was public and that was very scandalous and that was very like started that crisis really was in 2010 and was this allegations against a very, very famous and charismatic priest that was a parish priest in a rich neighborhood in Santiago and who was also very conservative. He was one of the priests 
activists that supported Pinochet, that was friends of the military, was friends of very like rich people of the country and of the elites. And in some sense, he was like, he and others were like a counterpoint to this church that was involved in defending human rights, right? So the people who will not agree with this more progressive bent of the church will go and take refuge in this, especially people from the elites that will not agree with the bishop because they will support Pinochet, will go to this parish. And he was very, very influential among, amongst the elites. He was also a huge, he bring a lot of vocations into the priesthood. So at least I will say a third of the bishops in Chile come from his parish. And at least half of the priests in Santiago were vocations that were born at this parish. So then there, in 2010 came the three laymen denouncing this priest of sexually abusing them. And not only sexually abusing them, but also like there was this whole culture within this community that was very secretive, very abusive. There was a lot of horrible power dynamics. And of course, sexual abuse was like the, like the worst expression of this, but it was practically, practically a sect within Catholic Church and a sect that was protected because, because all these priestly vocations came in so then the bishop and also all this money comes in so then the bishop uh, is happy with this priest because he's bringing me vocations and money that's what I need to run my church <laughs> and, and, and there's this huge of course, impunity. So those were the first allegations. And I say because the three men that went to, because these three men went to church structures before they went to the TV, but nobody listened to them. And so like, like as a desperate move, they made this huge TV program about their stories. And that was the beginning of the explosion. So at, at, at first we thought, okay, this is something that happened in some, in this particular community that we were already very suspicious about. But what happened after Pope Francis visited Chile in 2018 is that because of some, so what happened was that a lot of new people started to denounce and we started to realize that this is not only a problem of a few priests in some places, but this is widespread everywhere. And part of that other thing that created a bigger scandal, and I think this is also maybe something different from the US and other parts, is that one of these bishops that was raised by this priest called Fernando Garadima that I was talking about before. He was moved from one diocese to another diocese in the south of Chile. And the people from Osorno, this other diocese in the south of Chile, said, we don't want him here. And they organized protests since the day he landed there against him. When he, in them, and there's videos I can send you, there's when there's this, he was already a bishop, but there was a mass when they gave him like the bishop ring and a mass. And so you will have most of the people in the church with black balloons and with signs against him. And of course, we know that in the church, Today, in canon law, for example, there's no structures that allow for lay people to remove a bishop or to even to give an opinion about who the bishop has to be. So these people in Osorno, most of the people in Osorno create this huge movement against this bishop and Pope Francis defended him until he went to Chile. And when he went to Chile, he realized that all the allegations against this bishop were true and that he was not given the, well, that's what he says, that <laughs> he was not given the right information about what was happening in Chile. And there was this huge scandal. And after the scandal, a lot of people started to to come out with new stories. From 2018, like 2018, 19, I remember like every time I went to see the news in Chile, you will see a new allegation and one by one, why one by one. So instead of here in Boston that you had like this huge article by the Boston Globe that you had almost all of the cases right there in one article, <laughs> what you had in Chile is that every week for almost two years, you have a new case. And the cases came not only from conservative sectors of the church, Church, also from very progressive sectors of the church. One of the priests that was in charge of Vicaria, who was defending human rights in that dictatorship, was at the same time abusing children in a Catholic school. So the same man that was speaking against torture was abusing children. And that's something that I will say, for, like for me, is even more disappointing 
because if you have like this very conservative allied with a with with the dictator kind of shady priest that is also an abuser it makes sense but if it also comes from people that were on the one hand defending human rights or helping the poor or whatever and then on the other hand had all these awful behaviors and committed crimes against children against uh, women against men it's, it's something that is so hard to reconcile in your head, head and in your heart all of the prestige that the Catholic Church had, especially after the dictatorship, because of this human rights work that the church did, because of the work that the church did to recover democracy, all that public voice, prophetic voice that the church had, it's dead today. It's absolutely dead because it doesn't matter if the bishop said something reasonable or not, people are not going to listen to them. And there's, before the sexual abuse crisis, priests in Chile, especially priests, were very, were public figures and were important public figures and they discuss politics and they will be invited to to tv programs etc today you don't see that nobody wants to listen to a priest honestly people are more interested in listening to other voices in the church and for example this group mujeres iglesia is has been important also a lot of lay movements inspired in Osorno, but from other places, people from Christian-based communities have been organizing to have a different voice within the church and to say, this doesn't represent us and we condemn this as well. But I think there's a wound, a big wound within the Catholic Church and between the Catholic Church and the wider society that it, it will be very, very difficult to heal. You asked me about liberation theology and the sexual abuse crisis. I've been surprised about how liberation theologians have not spoken about this at all, or very timidly. I think in part is because they're part of the clerical culture, especially the older generation of liberation theologians. So so they're they're also part of it. So some of them maybe lack of, of that critical distance to to speak about this. It has to do with what we were discussing before, how sexual and yeah, like imbalances of power that derive from gender and sexuality have not been fully acknowledged as a problem within liberation theology. And there might be more reasons, but and and also, of course, liberation theology today. It's not what it was 30, 40 years ago until, yeah, from the 60s, 70s until the 80s, they were part of the official structures in the church in Chile. They had the support of members of the hierarchy. They, the, the way they do did pastoral work was part of the how everybody did pastoral work. But today is not the case. Today we have mostly very conservative bishops that do not support liberation theology. So many lay people and also priests who are part of the liberationist movement are more marginalized, are still in the church, but have a more marginal position to say anything influential. Of course, a few of them, especially one of them that I know very well, Mariano Puga, who died two years ago, immediately welcomed the victims in his house and went to public demonstrations to support them. And there, there are, of course, priests and people who spoke against this before this was a scandal and tried to do something without success. But, but it's, it's marginal. It's really marginal. It seems like great work needs to be done and difficult work needs to be done, both in the areas of feminist liberation theology and then a liberation theology of the sexual abuse crisis. And so thank you for speaking to those difficult topics. There have been moments of this interview, Sole, where I have been filled with great enthusiasm, in particular thinking about the student movements, thinking about your own work with the Vicaria, these moments in our recent church history, which are great moments of light. And we've also spoken of these moments in recent church history, which are full of darkness and where the church itself becomes a source of oppress oppression, where the church is oppressor, a church qua a hierarchy in, in terms of liberation theologians, sometimes not being willing or dialoguing with the concerns about feminism. And then also times when the, the church hi hierarchy as well is oppressing women, children, and and men, and those who are on the margins. So I wonder, kind of in this difficult 
work that you do and that you study, where might, in order to kind of conclude, I think St. Ignatius of Loyola speaks about concluding with a moment of consolation and that uh, our listeners would be left on one hand with the struggle and with the difficulty and that that would inspire us to do the work that needs to be done, but at the same time to be inspired. Mm -hmm. I think that in recent episodes, we've spoken about prophecy and utopia and utopia is offers a horizon of hope, not a hope that is merely waiting, but a hope that turns into praxis, a hope that offers us a vision of justice so that we can precisely move towards it. And so what in your work and in your life, and maybe amongst the things we've talked about, things that we haven't talked about, uh, what provides a sense of hope and might have the potential to also foster concrete historical action? So, yeah, I, I, in terms of the sexual abuse crisis, I was just thinking about this. My husband says this a lot. He says the crisis was happening before when we didn't knew about this. Now that we know a huge thing has been solved because this will not be acceptable anymore. And part of my experience, and I have a lot of friends also that have, that are victims, have been victims within the church. I myself experienced abuse, power abuse in the community that I belong to. So I can like I can speak to that. And I think that this this scandals are public and that we're criticizing the church for this is for me a sign of liberation. It's a liberation for all those victims who were silent for many years and who thought that they were alone suffering this. And they suddenly realize I'm not alone. There's someone else who suffered the same thing and we can join together in solidarity and do something to change things. So in that sense, this crisis is a crisis that points towards liberation in the sense that, and that's, I think, what one of the things that I want to do as a theologian is precisely to liberation theology is all about salvation and liberation from oppression. So how do we bring that theology and that insight that our liberation from oppression is not only something that will happen when we die in the kingdom of God over there, but it's something that starts here in the concrete of our historical reality. So how do we bring that insight to the situation that we're undergoing now as church and as a country, in Chile at least. Politically, I have a lot of reasons to hope because a lot of the things, especially like this constitutional assembly, is, is a, it's a great mov- moment of renewal in Chilean politics, where new generations of people are being part of it. Half of the constitutional assembly is women because it's like we created a system to have parity. There's also indigenous peoples as part of the assembly that, or the convention that had never had a voice before. So what I see in all these movements, and maybe this connects also with the church, is that people who didn't had a voice for a long time in Chile, in Chilean society and in Chilean church, who experienced different forms of abuse, who experienced different forms of inequality and injustice, are raising their voices and are finding political paths to make those voices of protest to go from those voices of protest to new institutions, more democracy, more economical equality. Of course, it, there, it's a struggle and there's a lot of forces that are against this. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Maybe this new generation of politicians, they haven't been corrupted yet because they haven't had power yet, but we don't know what will happen when they get to power. We humans are very fragile and <laughs> and we make a lot of mistakes, right? So so nothing assures that this new generation of people will do everything right. Of course, there will be a lot of trouble also. And we don't have to be naive about that. But also without being naive, we can also have hope. In previous moments of Chilean history, big movements of the popular masses gaining power were crushed with dictatorships, especially the last one. At this point so far, it hasn't been crushed. And rather we've been able to, as a country, have a peaceful movement towards more democracy and more equality. So in that sense, I think there's a lot of reasons to hope. There's maybe less reasons to hope if we think of the church. As I said before, I see a lot of hope in, yeah, just the fact that people are speaking against this and that there's a lot of things that were acceptable before that are not acceptable now, just are creating a safer space for new generations 
but there's a lot of work to be do to be done on that sphere. I think, yeah, as I told you before, that the, that victims are able to say their truth and that that truth is acknowledged as the truth and not, yeah, and not like a delusion. And that they're being able to organize is certainly a good news for the church. And we need to learn to read that as a good news and not only like a source of scandal and lack of prestige. So we'll probably get out of this as a church with less power, but a church with more truth and a church where there's more equal relationships around between the different members and also more sexual honesty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That I think is very important. So I don't know how that church would do, look like. And I again, there's a lot of powers in place against any kind of change. But I think the scandal doesn't allow us to go back. And that's a good news. I could not agree more. We were speaking earlier about the See, Judge, Act model. And it seems that in this case, with the clerical sexual oppression, that it really does apply in that what the victims have seen uh, is now being seen uh, by the public. And that is leading to, of course, a, a judgment of these structures of, of patriarchy and sexual oppression within the church that is now transforming itself into action, which is going to lead us to a new ecclesial reality, which, as you say, hopefully will be one that will be will have certainly less uh, power and prestige, but could be closer to the truth and closer to the poor. So exactly. thank you so much, uh, Sole, for your wisdom, for your insight, for the amazing research that you do in all of the topics that we've shared, you know, in this hour and a half that we've been speaking, we've covered so many things, but we know that behind that are years of toil, research, life experiences that have led to the richness of this interview. So thank you so much for joining the Liberation Theology podcast. And if folks are interested in, which I'm sure they are, uh, in following your work and reading your book and maybe following the work that you do with Mujeres Iglesia, how can they do that? What's the best way for them to find you and uh, and follow the work that you're doing so that they can keep up with it? Okay, so first you can find my book. My book is in, it's in Spanish, sorry, it hasn't been translated, but a few articles have around the issues of the book. So you can find my book on Amazon, eh, on Kindle, and then you can go to my page in academia, academia.edu. And then you will find a lot of my articles. A few of them are in English, so and a few of them are in Spanish. And then also just I we have with a group of other women uh, from Mujeres Iglesia, we have a kind of a we haven't made it a podcast yet, but it's a conversation program in Instagram every Thursday at 9 p.m. Chile, that's 8 p.m. the U.S., that it's called a calzón quitado. That's an expression that we have, women have in Chile, that is speaking without underwear. So that means speaking with honesty about our issues. And it's a sentence that our abuelitas used to say, okay, we're going to speak a calzón quitado, we're going to speak the truth now. And it's also an expression that this huge liberationist, feminist, and also queer theologian from Argentina, Marcela Thaus Reed, uses in her book, Indecent Theology, that precisely does a lot of the critics that I've shared today, you can find in Marcela Thaus Reed's book. She's sadly not, not so famous in Latin America, in part because her work is mostly in English and also because she's very a scandalous writer. So <laughs> if you want some scandal, go to read her book, Indecent Theology. She's an inspiring figure for us also. And uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Agarzon Quitao, M-M, for Mary Magdalene. Absolutely. And I'll be sure to put links to those things in our messages on uh, social media and then also in the show notes for this podcast. So thank you so much for joining Sole and God bless you and the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you, David.
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Liberation Theology Podcast. Next time, we'll take a look at Juan Luis Segundo's essay on Revelation, Faith, and the Signs of the Times, another classic, groundbreaking text that turns theology on its head for the sake of liberation. But for now, let's end with a prayer, Mary's Magnificat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of the Almighty's servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. God's mercy is for those who fear God from generation to generation. God has shown the strength of God's arm. God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has helped God's servant, Israel, in remembrance of God's mercy, according to the promise God made to our ancestors, to Abraham and Abraham's descendants forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 